a hundred million years ago, these cliffs were part of the floor of a warm ocean. Earth back then was between spiral arms of the galaxy. All over the Earth, it was uh, much warmer. We had uh, dinosaurs sunbathing in Alaska or in Antarctica. About uh, 70 million years ago, uh, we started uh, approaching and entering the uh, Sagittarius uh, spiral arm. And Earth became exposed to a higher flux of cosmic rays because of all the stars uh, around us. This larger flux of cosmic rays was responsible for the formation of uh, more clouds and colder conditions here on Earth. The uh, ice sheets that uh, later formed, they actually pushed all those cliffs uh, out of the water like bulldozers and they uh, rippled the landscapes. So what we see here in these cliffs is a good example for hot conditions on one hand when those cliffs were formed and a cold ice house conditions which we have today which are responsible for the uplifting and uh, current conditions of this, these cliffs. It may sound strange to most people that we're talking about ice house conditions today, but if you look on the long time scale, you find that during most of Earth's history, we didn't have any ice caps whatsoever. Today we have. 450 million years ago, we had a very cold conditions here on Earth. However, we had more than 10 times as much CO2 in the atmosphere. So clearly CO2 is not a major climate driver, at least it wasn't a major climate driver then. When we talk about climate changes on these timescales, it is a kind of climate change that is much, much more dramatic than anything we have seen uh, in, our, in our history. When we are in between spiral arms, it looks as if we are in a warm period called a hot house, and most of the ice is simply melted. There's no, no ice at all. When we are in the spiral arms, uh, half the area of the Earth is simply covered with ice. And the changes in climate, I mean, are much, much more dramatic than anything we have seen recently. Over the past uh, billion years, Earth has passed through uh, periods when it was cold and periods during which it was uh, hot. And lo and behold, the periods during which it was cold synchronize with the astronomical data which tells us when we should have passed through spiral arms of the galaxy. At some point, I realized that you can actually uh, reconstruct the cosmic ray flux and you can do it with these things, with the iron meteorites, because iron meteorites, after they break off their uh, asteroids, they are exposed to cosmic rays and they record the cosmic rays in the solar system over hundreds of millions of years. And what you find is that this cosmic ray flux changes exactly as you would expect from the astronomical data on one hand. And it also changes exactly in sync with the uh, climate variations that you can uh, reconstruct using geological uh, records. I've been working almost all my, all my life on uh, issues related to the environment. And of course, one of the biggest and biggest problems and issues was and what was the climate and how the uh, temperature of the seawater changed. And we worked on the fossils like this, called, called brachiopods. These shells record the temperature of the past oceans. When they form, they reflect the temperature of the ocean water because they build in uh, the atom of oxygen, then you could measure this proportion of uh, oxygen and you could get a measure of the temperature of the past oceans and that, that means of the temperature of the earth and climate. So when we can measure this, we would get a record of ocean temperature for 500 million years. When I look at the data, I realized that actually there were some oscillations in the, the general trend of temperature and that those oscillations fit it quite well with what we knew from geology, what kind of a climate 
was at that time. Working with the, with the colleagues, we did an evaluation and statistical study of that, and we saw that there was some kind of a periodicity roughly over about 140 million years, switching back and forth between hot house and ice house. I suspected that the reason for the, this rough periodicity was something to do with the sky. But uh, I was searching for it and couldn't find anything. So essentially I gave up. I didn't have an explanation. Jan Weiser, he reconstructed the temperature uh, using uh, geochemical uh, records. And the difference between that uh, reconstruction and what I was using is that Jan Weiser actually reconstructed the actual temperature. So he knew exactly how warm it was and how cold it was. So uh, I emailed uh, him. One evening, I was sitting in my office working. Suddenly, an email popped up. And this was near Shariv. And uh, he says, well, I may have an explanation for you. He was telling me that he was working on uh, cosmic rays variability over the more or less the same time intervals, and that the variability in the amount of cosmic rays hitting the Earth over this time interval was more or less similar to uh, the variation on, in uh, the, those oxygen atoms or in the climate which we observed. After I teamed up with uh, Jan Weiser, we had an actual temperature reconstruction. And what we could learn was that it was colder here on Earth by something like 5 to 10 degrees when we were inside spiral arms of the galaxy. Nobody found anything uh, like that before, and we were simply amazed for mix. Uh, but more interestingly, what it means is that cosmic rays are the main climate driver on Earth, at least on geological timescales. And the only explanation uh, you have for it is uh, Svenskmark's theory about the uh, cloud cover. When you compare the geological record to the astronomical record, that's what you get. You see that the two barcodes give you the same product. The black line is the geological reconstruction of the temperature on Earth using the geochemical uh, records that, uh, of uh, Jan Weiser. And what you see in the red is the uh, cosmic wave flux variations. When both things are added together, they correlate very well. Statistically, it's very significant, uh, but you don't have to believe the statistics. You can just look at it and realize that uh, it's, it's very meaningful. It's been said so many times that the sun has not been responsible for the heating we have seen uh, the last maybe 20, 40 years. However, if you look at the data, for instance, the ocean data, you will actually see that there's a very good agreement between temperatures and solar activity. And what you see is the temperature of the ocean down to about 50 meters. But if you compare the overall agreement with how the red curve is varying, it's very good. And the red curve, that is the cosmic rays. That is how the cosmic rays have been varying over this period. So we actually see even today that the sun is dominating the temperatures or how temperatures uh, evolve. It has done so in the past, it's doing this now and will also do it in the future. An experiment like the one taking place here in uh, Copenhagen is crucial because it, if successful it will shed a lot of light on the physical origin of the link between cosmic rays and climate. And this will be the last piece in the puzzle which would, would make the picture complete. So the effect, effective aerosol background corresponds more or less precisely to what you have over the ocean. The experiment uh, is not just something that you turn on and then you get the result. You get many, many results and you do a lot of experiments and you try to see if everything is consistent with that interpretation that you are giving. The results of this experiment, hopefully we will know exactly how the sun affects climate, how it modulates the cosmic rays reaching the Earth, how cosmic rays control the amount of uh, ionization, and how ionization controls climate, uh, and through uh, most probably uh, formation of cloud cover.